a great day to one and all. Welcome to the day five of our class. And today we will be speaking mostly about parametric versus non-parametric tests. And last time I gave you four, uh, I gave you the parametric tests, right? So if you could still remember, we discussed or talked about independent samples t-test, dependent samples t-test, one-way ANOVA, Pearson's R, and also simple linear regression. And this time, I will be speaking with you or uh, relaying to you some of the, uh, uh, the non-parametric counterparts of those first four tests I have mentioned. So let's first have the appreciation of data. And remember last time when we have descriptive statistics, it aims to describe data, for example, by means of frequencies, percentage, ranks, measures of central tendency, and variability. And apart from that, we have also discussed another branch or area of statistics, which is what we call inferential statistics. And in inferential statistics, we study a sample on the same data, and probably out of that sample, and if the sample is truly representative of the population, then whatever is true for the sample can, can be generalized to be true for the population. Okay? So, last time as well, um, we have discussed about the errors that one can commit in making a decision, particularly in hypothesis testing. The first one, if you could still remember, is we have what we call type 1 error. It is also known as alpha error or a false positive error. So type 1 error is when you reject a true null hypothesis. Another type of error that one can commit is what we call type 2 error, also known as beta error or false negative. In type 2 error, you know that the null hypothesis is false, but you did not reject it. So again, these are the two types of errors that you could commit. And we have also discussed last time that most of the time or majority of the statisticians agree that type 1 error is worse than type 2 error. Also, um, if the null hypothesis is false and if you rejected it, that is actually uh, a good or it's actually okay because you should reject something that's false. And if something is true, we should not reject that idea. That's why this is also uh, correct. Okay? So I hope it's clear. Now, apart from that, statistics, in particularly in hypothesis testing, one may need to use parametric tests or non-parametric tests, depending whenever you are able to satisfy the conditions or the assumptions of the use of the said test. Take note that in parametric, if you use parametric tests, most of the time, if, again, you satisfy all conditions, then whatever is true for the sample can be extended to be true for the entire population. Whereas for the use of non-parametric tests, whatever may be concluded from the sample may not be always true for the whole population. It may be true for the sample, but um, this could maybe be due to bias or say sampling error perhaps. And now, here's the difference between parametric and non-parametric tests. So we have here this simple uh, table. In parametric tests, usually you could use parametric tests if your dependent variable, for example, are either ratio or interval data. Remember, we have four levels of measurement. We have nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And for you to use parametric tests, again, your dependent variable should be ratio or interval. However, for non-parametric tests, 
it could be used if your dependent variable is ordinal or nominal. But there are also instances from other authors wherein if you were, uh, you could actually use non-parametric tests even if your data is interval or ratio. Actually, in fact, you could use any of this, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio for non-parametric tests. Because later on, no, um, if you are not able to satisfy the conditions of parametric tests, probably you need to use non-parametric tests. That's why there are instances wherein even though your dependent variable is ratio or interval, still some statisticians use non-parametric tests. And for parametric tests, it's assumed that you have a normal distribution. But for non-parametric tests, any type of distribution is okay. And usually for parametric tests, the mean is, usual, is the usual central measure. That's why the mean is usually solved or determined. Uh, I mean, if you are going to use mean, then probably, and if the mean is really the best measure of central tendency, then you might consider uh, using parametric tools. However, for non-parametric tests, the median is the usual central measure. For parametric tests, usually the information about the population is completely known. So you know your parameters. For example, you have an estimate of the population mean and the population standard deviation. Whereas for non-parametric tests, no information about uh, is available about the data. However, the use of parametric tests is more stringent it's more strict. That is why before using, um, before using parametric tests, it is very important that you check the assumptions of each test. If they satisfy the use of parametric tools, then parametric tests can be used. However, for non-parametric tests, it is an assumption-free test. Now, so here are, remember last time we talked about pair t-test. Pair t-test is the other term for dependent t-test. We have unpaired t-test. Unpaired t-test is the other term for independent samples t-test. Pearson correlation, your Pearson R, and your one-way analysis of variance. And if you could see at the column there at the right, we have there their corresponding non-parametric equivalent. Meaning to say, for example, you wish to use paired samples t-test or dependent samples t-test. But if you were not able to satisfy some conditions for perhaps of, of dependent samples t-test, then you can use its non-parametric counterpart, which is what we call Wilcoxon rank sum test. Dalawa po yan. We have rank sum and we have assigned rank. No? So anyway, both of them yield similar results. For independent samples t-test or unpaired t-test, its non-parametric counterpart is man with me u test For Pearson correlation or Pearson R, you can use Spearman correlation or Rho. And for one-way analysis of variance, you can use what we call Kruskal Wallis test. Do we have any questions so far or clarifications? Questions? No question? <laughs> okay. So, so we have here the table, table one, uh, corresponding table for parametric tests and their non-parametric equivalents. So again, for the level of measurement of your dependent variable, for parametric, it should be interval or ratio, whereas for non-parametric, it could either be categorical or nominal. 
meaning, or it could also be rank or ordinal. Of course, it's either nominal or ordinal. For parametric, we could also have z-test or t-test. For non-parametric, you could have their chi-squared test as their um, counterpart. Independent samples t-test, you could use man with u. For paired sample, we have Wilcoxon sign rank. For one-way ANOVA, Kruskal Wallis H test. For uh, repeated measures ANOVA, you could use Friedman's ANOVA. And for Pearson's test, you have here your Spearman row. And you could also use, uh, we also have here some other tests, no? But since we have limited time, so we cannot discuss us uh, all of these tests. Now, for example, you might be thinking about one sample. When we say one sample, there's only one set of data involved. For two samples that are independent, meaning two data sets from different groups, for example, male and female. Can you remember our independent sample state test? So those two samples are independent because one group is totally not related or independent of the other group. For example, males is a different set than females. So one group is males, the other group is females, that's independent. For example, you could also have, say, um, location, urban, rural. So those two are independent. If you have two samples that are dependent, meaning to say you gathered two sets of data from the same group, that is paired data. For example, uh, if you have one male group, you gathered their pre-test and post-test. Or let's say, if you wish to determine if a certain um, weight loss pill is effective, probably you could gather their weight before and after the intervention. So you see, you gathered paired data from each member of your uh, group. That's why that's already dependent. If you have K samples independent, so you, for example, if you have three or more groups, just like in our one-way ANOVA last time, for example, um, uh, for civil status, you could have single, married, widow, separated, etc. They are independent. But when we say K samples that are dependent, there are three or more data sets on the same group. For example, up one person, uh, you gathered his temperature. His, uh, for example, you have one group of uh, people. You gather their temperature today. You gather the temperature tomorrow. You gather their temperature the next day. Let's say you gathered five sets of temperatures for five consecutive days. So you see, that's already uh, dependent for K samples, where the K here is usually greater than two, if you have three or more na groups. No? Okay. So for example, determine what test is most appropriate or what percentage are females. The best thing here is what percentage? Of course, you could use percent, right? Your frequency count and your percent. Okay, how about the second one? Who earns more, single or married? Okay, clue, it's a measure of central tendency. Will you use, which is applicable, mean, median, or mode? Who earns more? We're going to use what? Mean, median, or mode? We could use the mean or the average, no? Probably, if the data is skewed, we could also say median. If we have the third one, what is the awareness level among civil status and sex levels? Probably, you could use your mean here. For the fourth one, what is the relationship between income and spending? Relationship. So among the tests that we discussed last week, 
what test was all about relationship? Can you still remember that? Which of independent t-test, dependent t-test, ANOVA, or Pearson R could measure relationship between income and spending? Please try to recall. Independent, okay, that's dependent. Okay, sabi ni ma'am, okay. So you said Ma'am Melissa and Ma'am Piliado, Pearson R, and I agree with that, no? So again, Pearson R, if you are able to satisfy the conditions, but if not, you could use its non-parametric counterpart, which is Spearman correlation. Determine the regression model that will predict spending by the knowledge of the number of of the number of companions at home. Or which is which of what we discussed last time? Independent, dependent, t-test, Pearson R, uh, linear regression, ANOVA. What do you think? Because this one regression model of course, you could use simple linear regression. Okay, thank you, Ma'am Christine and Ma'am Abigail. Okay. How about this? Let's assume for now, for now, let's say we will have non-parametric. Okay, please. I hope not uh, that you have the copy. Okay, for the meantime, let's assume that we will use non-parametric test. Okay, take a look at number one. Do the income of males and females differ significantly? What do you think can we use here among the non-parametric equivalent? If it's parametric, you will use... If it's parametric, you will use unpaired t-test or independent samples t-test, right? But assuming that we did not satisfy those assumptions, what can we use? We can use, very good, man with me, you test. So for number one, this could be man with me, you. How about the second one? Is sex associated with educational attainment? When we say associated, that's relationship. It's like asking, is sex related with educational attainment? What do you think can we use? Okay, Spearman correlation. Because it's the non-parametric counterpart of Pearson R. Very good. Next, number three. Is there a significant difference in spending when respondents are grouped according to school preference, sex, and civil status? Okay, let's talk about school preference. Let's say school preference. There are only two. Let's say public and private. Again, let's say, let's talk about school preference first. If it's uh, public and private, what will you use? Because there are only two groups, public and private. Wilcoxon, take note. Wilcoxon is the counterpart of dependent samples t-test. Because remember, school preference, you, uh, does the respondent prefer public school or does the respondent prefer private school? Okay, it's still man, Whitney, you. Because the two are actually independent. Now, they are two separate groups. How about sex? Sex is male and female. If it is sex, what do you think? It's still... Do you think this is dependent or independent on sex? Sex is still independent, right? So it's still man with me, you. Bakit natin masasabing independent? Kasi males is a separate group from females. How about the third one? Civil status. Let's say civil status is single, married, widowed. 
Again, for civil status, let's say single, married, widowed. So ano kaya? Okay. So what non-parametric test do you think? Because there are three groups. One group is civil. Ah, sorry. One group is single. Second group is married. Third group is widowed. But take note, we will use non-parametric for now. Again, let's assume that we will use non-parametric test. Okay, correct. We will use the Kruskal-Wallis H test. Again, in some references, they would say there's H, letter H. Kruskal-Wallis H. But in some references, they just say Kruskal-Wallis. Okay? How about this? If there a significant difference in the weights before and after the diet program? If there is a significant difference between the weights before and after the diet program? Before and after. Is that independent or dependent? But again, I would like you to answer um, the non-parametric counterpart. If there is a significant difference before and after the program. Okay, this is already dependent, no? So this is, uh, its counter non-parametric counterpart is Wilcoxon sign rank or sum rank test. Okay, rank sum test. Okay, thank you. So that's Wilcoxon. Now, so that's the first PowerPoint. So this time, what we are going to do next is I will acquaint you of the other tests. So let's have the first one. Wilcoxon sign rank test. Take note, there are two types of Wilcoxon. There is what we call sign rank. And there is also what we call sum rank. But nevertheless, they give you similar results. For the meantime, I will have Wilcoxon sign rank test. So when do you use Wilcoxon sign rank test? It is the non-parametric statistical hypothesis test when comparing two related samples, matched samples or repeated measurements on a single sample to assess whether their population mean ranks differ or not. All right. Now. Okay. And this is the non-parametric counterpart of dependent or paired samples t-test when the population cannot be assumed to be normally distributed. Just like what I said earlier, usually to use not a paired samples t-test like other parametric tests, it should be normally distributed. But if your data is not normal, then you can use Wilcoxon sign rank test. And here are the um, assumptions. The first one is data are paired and come from the same population. So take note, same population. So um, in this case, there is only one set of population and you actually take or took two sets of data from them. Each pair is chosen randomly and independently and the data are measured to be at least on an ordinal scale. It cannot be nominal. Meaning to say, uh, that's why, I, this is what I'm about, uh, I would like to say, just like earlier now. Because earlier, I have mentioned that normally, if your data is interval or ratio, then you can use parametric tests. However, there is an exception. There are instances that your data is interval or ratio. However, some other assumptions were violated. And if that happens, then we can use 
non-parametric tests like Wilcoxon sign rank test, even though your data is interval or ratio. That's why there are exceptions to the rule. So here, your data, your dependent variable could either be interval, could either be ordinal, interval, or ratio, and cannot be nominal dapat. It can be used when comparing two related samples, match samples, or repeated measurements on a single sample to assess whether their population mean ranks differ. That is, it is a paired difference test. It is also used as an alternative to the paired students t-test or the t-test for, take note, paired students t-test is the other term for paired samples t-test or dependent samples t-test especially when the population cannot be assumed to be normally distributed. Questions about Wilcoxon sign rank test? So again, it has a similar objective with paired samples t-test or dependent samples t-test. It's just that it's non-parametric. Do we have any questions or clarifications, Bob? before I proceed with the next step or next test. Anything that you would like to ask or clarify? Because if there is none, then we will proceed with the next one. Okay, thank you. All right, let's proceed with the next one, which is the man with knee you test. So the man with knee you test is used to compare differences between two independent groups when the dependent variable is either ordinal or continuous, but not normally distributed. So again, it doesn't resemble the normal curve or the normal distribution. So you can use this if your dependent variable either is either ordinal, interval, or ratio, but again, not nominal. It is, it's often considered a non-parametric alternative to the independent samples t-test. Just like if you have two groups, you would like to compare the performance of males and females. Let's say what uh let's say who performs better in terms of academics? Is it the people living in the rural regions or is it those who are living in the urban regions? Who has higher test scores, Filipinos or non-Filipinos? You see, there are still two groups. And if ever your data is not normally distributed or you are not able to satisfy all the conditions on the use of parametric tools, then... Um, man with knee you test is better, a good alternative to independent samples t-test. Okay. For example, to understand whether attitudes towards pay discrimination, where attitudes are measured on an ordinal scale, differ based on gender. Like, um, in this case, attitude towards pay discrimination could be your dependent variable, Whereas sex or gender, either male or female, are your two independent groups. The conclusions can range from simply stating whether the two populations differ through determining if there are differences in medians between groups. And uh, again, take note, for non-parametric tests, we now use the median rather than the mean. All right. So uh, the assumptions, okay, who can read to us the assumptions? Can I ask you, Ma'am Ma Ami Rose, tell ya in? Assumptions number one, the dependent variable should be measured at the ordinal or continuous level. The independent variable should consist of two categorical independent groups. Okay, thank you. As what I've mentioned earlier, your dependent variable could either be ordinal, interval, or ratio, but not nominal. 
your independent variable should consist of two categorical independent groups. Take note, two categories only, like sex, male, female. If you have three or more, for example, civil status, single married widowed, then probably you might consider other tests aside from man with new tests. And of course, the two groups should be independent. Okay, next. Please read the next assumption. Uh, can I have you to read for us, Ma'am Florence? Okay, sir. The two variables are not normally distributed. However, you have to determine whether the two distributions have the same shape, sir. Okay, thank you. So take note. For example, this one, they are not normally distributed, but if you could see their shapes are similar. So you could use also um, man with new. Okay, please read to us this example. Can I have you, um, Ma'am Abigail, please? Uh, example, a researcher decide, decided to investigate whether an exercise or weight loss intervention was more effective in lowering cholesterol levels. The researcher recruited a random sample males that were classified as overweight. This sample was taken randomly split into two groups. Group 1, underweight, a calorie-controlled diet. Uh, the diet group and who undertook an exercise training program. Example, the exercise group. In order to determine which treatment program was more effective, the cholesterol concentration paired between the two groups at the end of the treatment program. Okay, thank you. That's why two groups, no? And take note that two groups are independent. So to do this, um, you could have these following steps. So you could go to analyze. So if you could just take a screenshot of this, no? But uh, take note, you can do this if you need to run that test. Take note, if you realize that Instead of using independent sample t-test, then you can use this. Then you could follow these steps um, for you to do such tests. But in this test, no, there are some steps that could actually be uh, that are actually optional and can be skipped. For example, if you wish to do man with me you test, let's say. I would like to determine if there's a significant difference in the monthly expenditures of employees when they are grouped according to sex. So sex here is male or female, and uh, your monthly expenditures is in scale. It's I, it's actually interval here, no? But assuming that I was not able to satisfy all the conditions on the use of a uh, non-parametric test, so here's my sex, here's my monthly expenditures. To do this, I could go to analyze, uh, non-parametric tests. Then I will go to legacy dialogues and click two independent samples like this. And if here's the case, so I will place sex in the grouping variable. And you could see there's a question mark here. I will write group one as one. And I will write group two as two. Why is this so? Because group one earlier is the males and group two is the females. I hope it's clear with us, Paul. Then you click continue. Then let's place monthly expenditures in the test variable part. And you could see that man with new test is automatically uh, checked. If you're done with this, click OK. And you will have this result. So take a look. These are the mean ranks, the sum of ranks. And here's the man with new value of 32.000. And the asim sig two tailed, this is actually your p value. Is this great? Uh, and, assu and assuming that our alpha is 0 0.05, is this greater than 
equal or less than your alpha? This 0.216, is it greater than, equal, or less than your alpha? Greater, greater, greater than. Greater than, right? And if it's greater than 1, if it's greater than 0 0.05, I mean, what is our conclusion? Is it the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis? Null hypothesis. Null hypothesis. Very good. So in this case, you will report the null hypothesis. Okay, so you see the interpretation is very much similar to the other tests that we have run. So that's how we do uh, man with me you test. Okay? Okay, let's proceed to Kruskal Wallis H test. The Kruskal Wallis H test is also called the one way ANOVA on ranks is a rank-based non-parametric test that can be used to determine if there are statistically significant differences between two or more groups of an independent variable on a continuous or ordinal dependent variable. Normally, we use this for three or more groups because for two groups, uh, for the non-parametric tests, now if there are two groups, we can use man with me you. And if we have three or more, we can use the Kruskal Wallis H test. But of course, honestly, you can use Kruskal Wallis H test even for two groups. And it's an extension of the Man with Me U to three or more groups. It is considered as the non parametric equivalent or alternative to the one way ANOVA and an extension of the man with me U test to allow the comparison of more than two independent groups. So for example, just like if you have a sec, I mean, if you have civil status, single, married, widowed, this one has three categories, then we can use Kruskal Wallis H test. Okay, please read also, no? Uh, please, can you please read this for us? Uh, can I have you, Ma'am Nella Joy Asong? Okay, good morning, sir. Morning. Batiyan ako, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So it is important to realize that the cross uh, cross Wallis H test is an omnibus test statistic and cannot tell which specific groups of independent variable are statistically significantly different from each other. So it only tells that at least two groups were statistically different. Okay, thank you. So as an omnibus test, if there is if there is uh, no significant difference, then all pairs of groups or categories have no significant difference in terms of the dependent variable. However, if there is a significant difference, meaning to say it's possible that at least one pair of groups or at least one pair no, of uh, medians, for example, are statistically different from one another. So here are the different assumptions of the use of your Kruskal Wallis. Please read this for us, um, Ma'am Melissa. Good morning, sir. The first assumption is the dependent variables should be measured at our ordinal or continuous level, example, interval or ratio. Number two, the independent variable should consist of two or more categorical independent groups. Number three, there should have independence of observations, which means that there is no relationship between the observations in each group or between the groups themselves. Okay, thank you. So you see, these are also the assumptions of man with me you test. Similar assumptions, it's just that you have three or more groups. Okay. Question so far? No question so far? Okay. Now. Okay, thank you. 
So here is an example. Uh, would you mind reading this one for us? Uh, Ma'am. Okay, can I have you, Ma'am Christine Bado? Good morning, sir. Morning. Example, a medical researcher has heard anecdotal evidence that certain antidepressive drugs can have the positive side effect of lowering oh, neurological yeah. pain in those individuals with chronic neurological back pain when administered in doses lower than those prescribed for depression. The medical researcher would like huh? to investigate this anecd anecdotal evidence with a study. The researcher identifies three well-known antidepressive drugs which might have this positive side effect and labels them drug A, drug B, and drug C. The researcher then recruits a group of 60 individuals with a similar level of back pain and randomly assigns them to one of three groups, drug A, drug B, or drug C treatment groups and prescribes the relevant drug for a four-week period. At the end of the four-week period, the researcher asked the participants to rate their back pain on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 indicating the greatest level of pain. The researcher wants to compare the levels of pain experienced by the different groups at the end of the drug treatment period. Okay, thank you. So you see... There are three groups, no? So you have drug A, those who administer drug A, drug B, and drug C. So three different groups, three independent groups, and you would like to determine uh, if there's a difference um, in the dependent variable, no? So how to do this in SPSS? So let's have this data set. Um, it's there in the PowerPoint, but I can show you, no, uh, how it's being done. So if you could see from here, uh, I would like to compare if there's a significant difference in the monthly expenditures when they are of employees when they are grouped according to stable status. So if you could see here in the variable view component for stable status for the values, one represents single, two represents married people, three represents uh, widowed people, as shown here in the data view. And these are their monthly expenditures, all right? So to do one way, uh, I mean, Kruskal Wallis H test in uh, SPSS, first, let's go to analyze. After analyze, you go to non-parametric tests, and after which, you go to Legacy Dialogues and choose K-independent samples. Take note, you will choose two independent samples if there are two groups, so you will use man with you. But if you have three or more groups, choose K-independent samples. The K here is usually uh, three or more groups, okay? So choose K independent samples. And here, you see that the Kruskal Wallis H test is automatically, Kruskal Wallis H is automatically checked. Let's put the civil status in our grouping variable. We have to define range because you could see there are question marks. Click define range. The minimum is one and the maximum number is three, right? You might be asking, sir, how come one and three? Because you have three groups. One is the smallest number earlier. One, remember, is single. Two is married. And three is widowed. That's why the smallest number is one. And the largest number or the maximum is three, which is four, widowed. It is assumed that two, which is married, is also part of that range. No? Then click continue. So you have your, your stable status from 1 until 3. Then you click monthly expenditures. Then click it going to the test variable. And if you were able to do this, click OK. 
And here is your results. Take a look. Your chi-square value is 3.028. The DF or the degrees of freedom is 2. And the asymptotic significance, this is your p-value, is 0 0.220. Again, assuming that um, our alpha equals 0 0.05, will you reject null hypothesis or not reject the null hypothesis? Because this one is greater than 0 0.05. Reject or not reject null hypothesis? Not reject, sir. Very good. Mm, ano, sir, we not will not reject. reject. Tama. Okay. So therefore, if you will not reject the null hypothesis, what will be your conclusion? Is it the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis? Null hypothesis. Null hypothesis. Very good. So in this case, you could say, that there is no significant difference in the monthly expenditures of employees when they are grouped according to civil status. It means that single married, single widowed, and married widowed, whatever pair of uh, monthly expenditures are not significantly different from one another. Questions or clarifications, moms and sirs? At least, no, you have an idea how to run the said test if ever you need to. Okay? I hope it's clear with us. All right, let's proceed to another one. And we call this Spearman's rank order correlation, or simply Spearman row. So if the assumption or the assumptions of the use of Pearson's R, which is uh, would tell us, which would tell us if there's a significant relationship between two uh, variables that are at least interval, and uh, you could run Spearman's correlation if needed. For example. If your sample size is less than 30, or if you have less fewer than 30 example, uh, samples, and if your variables are ordinal, then you could run Spearman's correlation instead of uh, Pearson's R. Would you mind reading this one for us, um, Ma'am Florence, if you don't mind, Po? Ako mabasa, sir? Yes, Po. Okay. The Spearman's correlation, and the Spearman's ranks order correlation, or often called as abbreviated to Spearman's correlation, calculates a coefficient of R or P, or pronounced as rho, which is a measure of the strength and the direction of association relationship between two continuous or ordinal variables. For example, you could use a Spearman's correlation to determine whether there is an association between exam performance and time spent revising. For example, where an exam performance and the time spent revising are both measured on a continuous scale. Okay, thank you. So in this, so you see, no, it has a similar objective with Pearson's R. It's just that you violated some assumptions of Pearson's R. Um, may I ask you to continue reading for us, um, Ma'am Piliado? For example, okay. Am I here, sir? Yes, yes, ma'am. Alternately. Okay, sir. Spear also used a Spearman correlation to determine whether there is an association between level of physical activity and cholesterol concentration, where level of physical activity is measured on an ordinal scale, sedentary, low, medium, and high, and cholesterol concentration is measured on a continuous scale using MOOL per liter. 
You could also use a Spearman's correlation to determine whether there is an association between depression and length of unemployment. So example where depression is measured on an ordinal scale, non, mild, moderate, and severe, and length of unemployment is also measured on an ordinal scale, short-term, medium-term, and long-term unemployed. Okay, thank you. That's why in this case, no, normally if you use Pearson's R, both of your data could either be inter both of them interval, both of them ratio, or one interval and one ratio. However, if one of your data is ordinal, for example, and the other is the uh, for example, if one of them is ordinal and the other could be ordinal interval or ratio then Spearman's correlation is better or it should be used rather than Pearson's R. So here are the assumptions of Pearson's R. The first one, you have two variables that are measured on a continuous and or ordinal scale. So you see, no? Paulit-ulit lang siya sa non-parametric, no? Um, like just like kanina. That's why in this case, it's important that your data is either ordinal, interval, or ratio. Okay, the second one, your two variables represent paired observations. So just like when we say paired observations, um, from a certain person, for example, you will gather two, two data or one pair uh, of data. For example, the, the first uh, data, the first datum you took from a person is his height. The second datum is his weight. You would like to determine if there's a relationship between height and weight. Ideally, it's good to use Pearson's R. But since assuming that you were not able to uh, satisfy the conditions on the use of Pearson's R, then you can resort, resort to Spearman's correlation. Okay. Okay, there needs to be a monotonic relationship between two variables, just like this. When we say monotonic, it's increasing all throughout, decreasing all throughout, but not both. For example, in this data set, it seems like the data is suggesting decreasing trend. Here, it's an increasing trend. But here, this is non-monotonic because there are some portions that, that it's suggesting increase, but in here, it's already suggesting falling action or decrease, no? All right. That's why dapat monotonic. So here are some study designs that you can use. So if there's a relationship between two variables, paired observations, I have mentioned about it. Relationship between one or more changes in measures. For example, uh, Okay, please read the example for study design number two. Uh, can I have you, ma'am? Can I have you, ma'am, Besidilias, Lady May? Ma'am, Lady May, hello. Or basi hindi ka sulod si hindi ko sure no. Um, can I have you instead? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, 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 go ahead, ma'am. Yes, sir. Go ahead, pa. Please read. Um. Study design number two. Determine if there is a relationship between one or more changes in measures. A spare months correlation as. For example, you could have first calculated a difference score, score, also known as a change score or a gain score, between two time points or two conditions, and then use a Spearman's correlation to determine whether there was a relationship, example, an asso association or relationship between this difference score and another variable. Okay, thank you. So in interpreting your Spearman's row, you could use uh, this part here. It's similar. The table is similar to that of your Pearson's R. 
And you could use this part here no, to interpret. So remember, the correlation coefficient here is 0.729, for example, uh, in this. no, In the take nota, huh? this is time, watching TV, cholesterol level, for example. So in this case, 0.729, this is a strong correlation. Remember the scale we had last week? So you can still use that uh, to, I, I believe, no, you can still use that to interpret your correlation coefficient. As the sign of the Spearman correlation coefficient is positive, that you can conclude that there is a positive correlation between the daily time watching uh, TB and the cholesterol concentration. That is, cholesterol concentration increases as time spent watching TV increases. The magnitude of the Spearman correlation coefficient determines the strength of the correlation as well. So the closer it is to 1, as the absolute value becomes closer to 1, the stronger the relationship. The closer it is to 0, the, uh, the smaller or the weaker the relationship is. So in this case, uh, a Spearman's rank order correlation was run to assess the relationship between cholesterol concentration and the daily time spent watching TV in males aged 45 to 65 years. 100 participants were recruited. Preliminary analysis showed the relationship to be monotonic as assessed by visual inspection of a scatter plot. Again, this is assuming that you have run this on independently on your own. There was a statistically significant strong positive correlation between daily time spent watching TV and cholesterol concentration. So this is how you report it, uh, your row. Then report your 98. Um, you might be asking, sir, where did this come from? So uh, you recruited how many people again? 100 participants, right? So just subtract by two. That will be your number here. And 0.729 is this correlation coefficient, your row. And your P, this one, is less than 0 0.005. In your case, you can just report 0 0.05, okay? Because it's assumed that we will use 0 0.05. Okay? Now, let's do it in your actual uh, SPSS. Let's say in my case... I would like to determine if there is a relationship, uh, for example, between stress level and business performance. Again, stress level and business performance. So here's the thing. Oh, sorry. So you could see that stress level, by the term itself level, this is ordinal data. Business performance in this case is also ordinal. So since remember, if they are both interval or uh, if at least if they are at least interval, then probably you could use Pearson's R and assuming you satisfied all the conditions of Pearson's R. However, since your data are your paired data are ordinal, then it's necessary that you should use a non-parametric test, which is in this case, um, Spear, uh, Spearman's rock. So, meron bang relationship si stress level sa business performance? So, take nota, in this case pala, I forgot to tell you, uh, the, the smaller the number, the lower the stress. The higher the number, the higher the stress. For business performance, same. The lower the number, the lower the stress. Uh, the, sorry, the business for business performance, the smaller the number, the smaller the business performance, the higher the number, the higher the business performance. So check natin. May relationship nga ba ang stress mo sa performance mo? So to do this, you could go to Anna, to do Spearman row, no? In uh Spearman's row in SPSS, we could go first to number 1. You click analyze. After analyze, you go to correlate still. 
and you go to bivariate. Same step as Pearson's arm. It's just that after you click this, you will uncheck the Pearson R. So you see, you know, check, clicking it will check or uncheck. But in this case, we need to uncheck this one, okay? And we have to check Spearman. Because in this case, our data are both ordinal. Then let's place together stress level and business performance. Let's highlight them. And, pre and place them together under the variable section. And after which, you can now click OK. And so you can see, no, ito po siya. 0 0.098, ang correlation coefficient. I think this is weak, no, because this is closer to 1. Take a look at the SIG2 tail. 0 0.605. Significant pa ang relationship o hindi significant? Check nyo po. Significant or not? Because this one, assuming uh, our points, uh, our alpha is 0 0.05, is this significant or not significant? Okay, we will. What? Should we report HO or report HA? Okay, not significant. And I agree no, with Ma'am Abigail. Because 0 0.605, which is the p-value, is greater than 0 0.05. So in this case, you will report null or alternative, kahit hindi significant. We will report HO. Very good. So thank you. So in this case, we could say that there is no significant relationship between stress level and business performance. Meaning to say, hindi related ang stress level mo sa business performance mo. Okay, thank you, class. Uh, thank you, mga moms, no? For the response. Okay. <laughs> All right. And so let's go to the last topic, which is your chi square test for independence. Now, the chi-square test for association tests whether, uh, tests whether two categorical variables are associated. When we say categorical, they are both, uh, say, um, let's say you have your levels there or you have your categories or your nominal data, for example. It determines whether two variables are statistically independent or not. And it is also often referred to as the chi-square test of independence. For example, um, it tests for the association or independence between two nominal variables. And you can test for ordinal variables, but you will lose the extra information provided by knowing the order of categories. So, for example, no, you have both if both of your data are nominal. For example, your first variable is sex. We have here the ladies and we have here the females. You have the males. And if they like scary movies, you would like to check if sex is associated for their liking of scary movies or not. Do you think I'm sex -bala related? Kung gusto mo ang scary movies or not. So, if girls, 32 of them like, no? 38 of them don't like. For men, 20 of them like and 12 did not like. The thing is, so you could see that 55.4 of them uh, said yes and 44.6 of them said no, no? If you wish, they could also have here, you could have the total of the girls and you could have the total of the boys as well. This test does not distinguish between dependent and independent variables, although your study design might do. So there might be a case wherein you might put your independent variable by rows and your dependent variables by columns. 
That's why, no? So you have to check your independent, if ever you have an independent variable, place their categories by rows. And if you have a dependent variable, place their categories by columns. And you will arrive to a cross tabulation. Okay. Now, so what is required? Please, uh, let's have the first one. Your two variables should either be ordinal or nominal lang din, ha? So kung interval or ratio siya, um, convert that to ordinal or nominal, anay? The second assumption is that your two variables should consist of two or more categorical independent groups. Okay. So for example, um, if they like movies, so... Yes, no, that's two categories. If you have, for example, civil status, one category is single, the other is married, the other is widowed, and both of them are ordinal. So, pwede nga isa ordinal, isa interval. Ah, sorry, both, pwede nga both of them ordinal. One could be ordinal, the other nominal, or the other way around, or both of them are nominal. Okay? So, like this, huh? This is your sex, which has two categories, male, female. This is the educational attainment without graduation, college, graduate, bachelor's degree holder, master's degree holder. Is there a relationship between gender and their highest level of education? So kung notice po natin, no, uh, without, kakaunti yung females na without graduation, medyo marami-rami yung mga males, females, at saka males na mayroong bachelor's degree. Halimbawa. Related nga ba yung sex sa, gen sa educational attainment ng isang tao? So if you would like to test, no? And both of them in this case, uh, sex here is nominal. Educational attainment is ordinal. So chi-squared test for association may be used here. All right? So you could use it in this uh, many study designs, no? So, for example, this one, this is the, another example, and you are free to read this on your own. And your null hypothesis, you could say there is no significant association between variable one and variable two. Variable one is the name of the first variable. Variable two is the name of the other variable. And for your alternative hypothesis, there is a significant association. So I just changed the no to a. Just like the usual nga na ginawa natin last time. Okay? Let us learn how to use the SPSS for this. No? In this example, there are three variables. Gender. Okay, so in my case, I'll use my own example. For example, um, if you would like to test, no? Uh, how for example I would like to determine is there a relationship between age group and teacher's knowledge take a look age group and teacher's knowledge is there a relationship between them here's the thing take a look for age group so for the if you so that you will have an idea about the age group categories, there are two there are two levels. No, the first one is the 25 to 30 years old, and the other one is 31 years old and above. So you see, this one now, age group is ordinal data. Now, I would like to compare if it is related to teachers' knowledge, related up and skill. Is age group related to teacher's knowledge? Teacher's knowledge here, in this case, has is also ordinal. It's either fair, good, and very good. Okay? So you see, in this case, uh, I would like to compare age group. If Is it really related to teacher's knowledge? And here's your data. This is your age group. And if you wish, no, you could see, no, ito, 31 years old and above, 25, and so on. No? So click this again. 
and so for teacher's knowledge, very good, very good, very good, 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 and so on. Okay. Now, are they really related? Take note that both of them are ordinal, right? Age group is ordinal. Teacher's knowledge and skill is also ordinal. So to do chi-square, let's click analyze first. Next, let's go to cross tabs, uh, to descriptive statistics, then click cross tabs, cross tabulation. Okay, click that. Let's say our independent variable is age. Let's the independent assuming huh, that age is the independent variable. Let's place it in the rows column. And assuming that teacher's knowledge and skill is the dependent variable, let's place it in the columns portion. And now you go to statistics. Okay. And click here, chi square. And you click V and Kramer's V. And you can also click gamma. Take note. You might be asking me, sir, when do we use them or not? Take note. You use V and Kramer's V if you have nominal data. You can use gamma if both of your data are ordinal. Okay? So in this case, since both of my data, no, age group and teacher's knowledge, are they are both ordinal. So I will just choose gamma. Take note, ha? If both ordinal, gamma ang piliin natin. Then click continue. For the cells, you click the cells. You click observe. And you could click, if you wish, to understand more of some of the descriptives about your data. You could click the row or column the percentages, no? And click continue. And if that's the case, you can now click, okay. And here is your table. So you could see, no? Ito po yung age group niya na 25 to 30 years old na merong fair, good, at very good na teacher's knowledge and skill. So you could see that meron siyang percentage within age group. For example, within age group, 13% uh, of them have fair teacher's knowledge and skill. 24.3% of them have good knowledge and skill. Whereas 62.6% .6 of them have very good teacher's knowledge and skill. In terms of 31 years old and above, 20.4% have uh, fair. 29.6% have good. And 50.0% have very good teacher's knowledge and skill. And here's your chi-square test, no? So makikita po natin that the Pearson chi-square po yung titignan natin, 0.263. So since it's greater than our alpha, which is 0.05, then we should report the null hypothesis. And take note din po ha, dito po sa ating, uh, ano, since... Pareho po silang ordinal, kaya gamma po yung pinili natin. Ito po yung relationship nila, oh. negative 2.33, and this one, no? yung kanilang significance level. So there are times na gusto mong i-report ito. There are also instances that some researchers prefer to report the actual gamma value. Okay? So in my case, uh, like in some schools, no, they prefer the gamma instead of this. But nevertheless, they are both not significant po. Questions or clarifications? Basta both ordinal, gamma ang pilion. Now, suppose pareho silang nominal. You would like to compare nominal and nominal. no? So for example, we have sex and we have school position. Sa sex, one is male, two is female. Whereas for uh, position, or let's say ito na lang pala. Uh, let's say school type. Let's say sa school type, nominal din siya. You are teaching sa private school ang one. 
you are teaching sa public school yung two. Okay? Now, you notice pareho silang nominal. May relationship nga ba ang sex sa kung saan ka nagtuturo? Kung sa public o private? So to do this, we can use again uh, chi-square. So to do this, click Analyze. Then go to Descriptive Statistics. So similar steps, click cross tabs pa rin. And tanggalin po natin ito, ibalik po natin. This time, ilagay natin si sex, assuming that sex is the independent kunwari, let's say sa rows. And then yung school type kung saan ka nagtuturo will be placed in the columns portion. Now, um, for the statistics, now, di ba pareho silang hindi, di ba pareho silang nominal? So, and take note, so therefore, gamma here is not applicable because gamma will be used if both data are ordinary. So, in this case, we will uh, we will choose phi and Kramer's B. Again po ha, we will choose phi and Kramer's B if both our data are nominal. So, click continue. And for the cells, ganun pa rin po. Okay. Then click continue. So now you might be asking, Sir, may nakita akong nominal dito na fee. Nominal by nominal. Pwede siyang fee. Pwede rin siyang Kramer's B. Notice nyo po, parehas po sila ng itsura. It's just that yung fee ay merong negative, yung Kramer's B merong positive. Take note po ha, that both fee and Kramer's B will have the same absolute value po. However, when not take note po ha, non-directional po sila dapat. Yung nire-report po natin sa fee at Kramer's B ay dapat positive lang po. And you could see, no, 0.497. And you might be asking, sir, sige dito yung report ko. Should I report the fee or should I report the Kramer's B? And the answer is, ito po yung basihan. You will report the Kramer's, the fee, take note, fee and Kramer's V are both measures of association. However, fee is suitable when you have a dichotomous variables, two by two, cross tabulation. And samantalang, if it is not two by two, halimbawa yung isa two by three, Kramer's B po yung gagamitin natin. So dito po sa ating example, balik po tayo. We will use fee. Bakit? Kasi ang sex, 2. Dalawa po. Sa school type, 2 din. Dalawa din. 2 by 2. That's why here, the most appropriate to report is fee. Okay? Now, Nag-gets po natin, bakit 2 by 2? Kasi dalawang kategory sa sex, dalawa rin kategory sa school type. Pero kapag yung isa po sa kanila ay merong 3 or more, yung isa 2, yung isa 3 or more, or both of them have 3 or more, automatic uh, fee po yan. Uh, automatic Kramer's fee po yan. Okay? Let's see. Let's see if in our data, no? Uh, position is also two categories. Okay? Take it. So you could see, no? That's why, dahil both of them have two categories, that's why yung ginamit po natin ay fee. Pero kung may three or more pa po, you will use uh, Kramer's V. Okay? That's why dito fee po yung ginamit. And this is a way no, for you to report your findings sa fee. All expected cell frequencies were greater than 5. Kasi it's a requirement po in using this na dapat kada cell merong more than 5. Like this po. Uh, let's see the cross tabulation. Notice yung po. 18, 7, 10, 15. Lahat sila more than 5 yung frequencies. Okay. So you could also report your findings like this. 
a chi-square test for association was conducted between gender and preference for performing competitive sport. All expected cell frequencies were greater than 5. I emphasize that because that's an assumption of chi-square. There was a statistically significant association between gender and preference for performing competitive sport. So this is the chi-squared value with a p-value. There was a moderately strong association between gender and preference for performing competitive sport. This is your fee, na 0.22 at p equals 0 0.023. And that's why, no? This is your, uh, for example, your research problem is, is there a significant relationship between sex and preference for competitive sport? You're not, okay, please read for us the rest. Can I have you to read it po? Um, can I have you, Ma'am uh, Marichu Tiolo? Okay, statement of hypothesis. Okay. Go ahead, Ma'am. Or there is no significant relationship between sex and preference for competitive sport. H1, there is a significant relationship between sex and preference for com competitive sport. B, variables, sex, either male or female. Preference for competitive sports, either yes or no. C, statistical test use, chi-square test for association. Okay, thank you. And suppose... This is your SPSS result, assuming. Please read the conclusion na lang po, ma'am. Padayon. Okay. E conclusion. A chi-square for association was conducted between the gender and preference for per performing competitive sport. All expected cell frequencies were greater than five. There was a statistically significant association between gender and preference for performing competitive sports, x to okay, 1 is equal to 5 point, uh, squared, 5.195, p is equal to 0 0.23. There was a moderately strong association between gender and preference for performing competitive sports, gamma. P. This is P. 0 0.3 to uh, P. Uh, 0 0.3. 322 and P is equal to 0 0.23. Okay, so in this case, um, the professors wanted you to report both, no, if ever there are. Uh, okay. With that, that concludes all of our lessons. Thank you so much and have a great day.